What's up, everybody? Welcome back to this Thursday edition of the Pack a Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. Thanks so much for being here today. Yesterday, we went over the 10 biggest winners of the Packers offseason so far. Today, unfortunately, we're going to be going over the 10 biggest losers. Before we get there, though, a couple house cleaning items or housekeeping items, I guess. Number one on my list is just a huge shout out and congratulations to the one and only Tom Grassi who has done insane work raising, I think the last I checked, over $330,000 for St. Jude's, the 30 stadiums in 30 days. I'll be, I didn't know what to expect or like how this was ultimately, like he just absolutely killed it. I am so proud for him. I am so happy for him. Uh, obviously fan of the Packaday or friend of the Packaday podcast here. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can uh, get him on the show to kind of discuss and go over everything. I'll certainly be efforting that as well at some point so we can go over everything. But if you haven't checked that out, make sure to do so. Uh, Tom Grassi, check out the, the 30 stadiums in 30 days. But just congratulations, Tom. You killed it. And uh, I think as uh, all Packer fans and all of Packer Nation, just super, super proud of you and everything that you've been able to do. So keep killing it and kudos on all the work that you've done and all the money that you've raised for an incredible, incredible, incredible cause. Secondly, my other housekeeping item here is I omitted one winner from yesterday. So yesterday I went over the biggest winners of the offseason for the Packers, and I failed to mention the fact that the Packers are going to be hosting the 2025 NFL Draft, which was a huge win for Mark Murphy and his legacy, a huge win for the Green Bay Packers as an organization, a huge win for the city of Green Bay, and ultimately, and maybe most importantly, a huge win for the fans of Green Bay and the Green Bay Packers, right? So that was a massive, massive win this offseason. So didn't dawn on me. I didn't I didn't see anyone comment on it or anything, but it was definitely one that I omitted and dawned on me as I was uh, doing some thinking for this episode today. So that was another huge win for the Packers this offseason. So I had 10 yesterday. I had one bonus one. This will be my second bonus one on that list as well. So actually 12 winners from the Packers offseason. Go back and listen to that one if you haven't already. It was a really fun episode to do. I realized yesterday I wore a black sweatshirt on my winner's day. And today, for whatever reason, I'm wearing white. On my lo- I should have switched them. I should have went all heavenly and white and nice Andy on the winner's podcast. I should have went all dark and black and evil Andy on today's show. Uh, but I think the really good news here is ultimately this was a tough list to put together. I don't think there've been very many, you know, quote unquote losers for the Packers this off season. It was, like I said, a lot of these names that we're going to be going over today are of pretty little consequence in the whole scheme of things, which is a good thing. I don't think there's been anyone that you've looked at through OTAs and mini camps. You're just like, man, are they having a rough go of things? Like they just look terrible or any, like, I don't think anything like that. So this was a much harder list to put together, which is, like I said, a great thing. The the winner's list, we had, you know, 10 plus one yesterday, another one today. This was a much, much, much more difficult list to throw together. So let me start with number one on my list. And I'm going to have a little bit of an aside here as well. So forgive me in advance, but Mercedes Lewis slash Mason Crosby. I think that is clearly the biggest, you know, I, I guess like just the two that really did not benefit from the Packers going in this new direction, right? You could make an argument that if Aaron Rodgers came back and was still quarterback of this team, that there probably would have been a couple additional veterans around this team. And you could make the argument that maybe two of those veterans would have been Mercedes Lewis and Mason Crosby. I am still hopeful for both Mason and Mercedes that they are able to find jobs this upcoming season and that maybe this isn't quite the downfall or the the end for either of those players. But it could be. It could be retirement for Mason Crosby or Mercedes Lewis. Maybe on their own accord. Maybe they would love to still play and just don't have that opportunity. Either way, a tough offseason for both of them. And like I said, if Aaron is still around, maybe both of those guys are still on the roster right now as well. As far as Mason goes, just the consummate professional, a all-time great Green Bay Packer kicker. And I'm like I said, I'm wishing nothing but the best. I'm hoping he's able to latch, you know, latch on somewhere and find a team for this upcoming season. As far as Mercedes goes, I mentioned this in a, a tweet on Wednesday. I don't understand how he is not on a team right now. Now, one thing that I will say very clearly here is that it's very possible that this is of Mercedes, you know, Mercedes Lewis and his own accord and his choice. 
It's possible that he doesn't want to go through a, another long training camp at age 39. And that maybe, you know, come end of August, he's like, oh, okay. Yeah, now I'm interested in signing with a team. Or maybe he's trying to hold out for a little bit more money and teams aren't, you know, eager to give that right now. That's a possibility as well. But man, if Mercedes does not find his way onto a team this season, that will be shocking. And I know people commented are like, ah, Andy, he's 39 years old and he has no receiving ability anymore. I'm well aware. I am very well aware. And I am king of the, hey, don't sign 39-year-olds bandwagon. Like you just, it's its not a, a smart in a lot of different ways. The one player that I would have thought about bringing back from a veteran standpoint for Green Bay this season was Mercedes Lewis. And I did a whole episode on that a few months back. So I'm not going to rehash all of that right now. I'm not a proponent of Green Bay signing him really at this point. They go out, they get Luke Musgrave, Tucker Craft. You still have Tyler Davis, Josiah DeGuara. I don't think that this is the right place or time for Mercedes in Green Bay. If they did it, I would certainly not be upset by it, but I don't think you need to be taking snaps away from any of the tight ends. I want to see them out on the field, quite frankly. But And, and some of that is for other teams as well. But this is arguably the best blocking tight end in football there has to be an appetite for that. And I don't care what his age is. I don't care what his receiving ability is. You can catch 10 passes a year, maybe one or two touchdowns is, you know, fooling a team in the red zone, maybe get a tight end screen and surprise someone for nine yards here or there. It doesn't matter. He is such an amazing blocker and he is such an amazing veteran leader and just locker room presence that it just, you would think that there would be some team out there that would be extremely interested in his services, even if only for a vet minimum. So I understand if the reason that he's not on a team right now is because he doesn't want to be on a team right now and wants to go, you know, have training camp expire first before he looks at, you know, different opportunities. But man, if he does not get a job, I will be super bummed because he's just, he's too good. He's too talented. And I want to see him get that one more run with some team this upcoming season. So Tough to say, though, that Mercedes Lewis and Mason Crosby weren't, you know, losers. I I hate the word. Like, I don't necessarily want to label either of them as that, but they were certainly not on the right side of things as the Packers decided to move in a different direction this offseason. And it's potentially cost them because right now, neither of them are on NFL rosters. Number two on my list is maybe the only one that just has like hasn't been off to a great start. And that's Sean Ryan. And Sean Ryan had an awful start to last season. I didn't think he showed up to training camp in great shape. I think he had a very tough go of things from the get-go. Then he gets suspended. He was never in the offensive line rotation. He comes back. He had a really bad holding penalty in one you know practice that was open to the media. And there just hasn't been any sign of like, oh yeah, Sean Ryan's ready to take a step. Like he's not even in the conversation for anything at this point. They've already been trying to move him around to some different positions to see if maybe something sticks. Maybe he can play a little bit of center. If there is a shining light for Sean Ryan, if you're looking for positives here from a Sean Ryan side of things, it's that he has, like they didn't draft any interior offensive linemen, right? Like they didn't draft any offensive linemen, which is a huge sign. Like the only, you know, they they didn't sign any you know undrafted interior offensive linemen that are of you know any major consequence at the moment that are look like they're going to compete at a high level. He probably just needs to beat out Royce Newman and Jake Hansen. Like that is the lowest hanging fruit at this point. And Sean Ryan was drafted earlier than either of those two players in the third round. He has more talent and upside than either of those two players. But he has to put something together and show that he is a worthwhile 53-man roster player or Green Bay could ultimately go in a different direction. And I didn't see a ton of sign, you know, a ton of signs in minicamps, OTAs, et cetera, that he's ready to take that next step. So it's great for him that maybe the competition isn't super steep on the interior of the offensive line right now. It still needs to be better for Sean Ryan. He needs to live up to that third round pick and he needs to figure out a way that he can compete not only for a 53-man roster spot, but find a way that he can help this team in some capacity. Because right now I have some concerns that that's ultimately going to end up being the case. And I love Sean Ryan coming out of college. I thought this was going to be a player that going as far back as last year was going to come in right away, have the opportunity to compete at right guard, maybe even start at right tackle. Well, you know, Elton Jenkins and David Bakhtiari got healthy and just none of it came to fruition. So I'm cheering him on. I hope nothing but the best for him. But so far, the first you know year plus for Sean Ryan has been really, really difficult. And that hasn't exactly turned the corner in 2023. Next up on my list is Bo Melton. Now, Bo Melton got poached off of the Seahawks practice squad and added to the Packers 53-man roster a season ago. So he is very much, you know, at that point in contention, you would think coming into this season, 
in contention for a 53-man roster spot. Again, they liked him enough last year to put him on it at the end of last season. Then Alan Lazard and Randall Cobb are gone. Like Lazard and Cobb are gone. So you're th- you're looking at this roster of your Bo Melton. You're like, all right, well, you know, Christian Watson's going to get a spot. Romeo Dobbs is going to get a spot. And then like, all right, Samori Toure, but I can like at least compete with Samori Toure. So like, this is, this is looking really good. You know, if you're in, if you're in the, the Bo Melton camp, like at minimum, like the, the odds of getting a number six wide receiver spot, like this feels pretty good. And then, but there's some rumblings, like maybe Green Bay could go wide receiver early and those sort of things. Maybe Jackson Smith and Jigba is going to be the pick. And you get through the first round and you're like, all right, they didn't take a wide receiver. And then they have the first second round pick and they take Luke Musgrave and you're like, all right, this is going great. And then they take Jaden Reed in the second round. And if you're Bo Melton, you're probably thinking like, all right, that's a receiver, but he's more of a slot guy. And like, I can do a couple different things. So that's not super, you know, that's not a huge deal. And you're still doing the wide receiver math in your head. And you're like, all right, so you've got Watson, you've got Dobbs, you've got Reed, you got Toure, you've got then me, Bo Melton. Like I'm, I'm number five on the list. And then you get through the third round, there's no wide receivers. You through the fourth round, there's no wide receivers. And then all of a sudden it's Dontavian Wicks. And you're like, all right, well, I'm still in the conversation. I just have to beat out a fifth rounder. At least I'm in the conversation here. I'm still the number six guy. Then they get Grant Dubose in the seventh round. And maybe even more importantly, they find Malik Heath in undrafted free agency. And now you're going from a guy who was on the 53-man roster. Lazard's gone. Cobb's gone. You're thinking that this might be your developmental wide receiver and a guy that you're keeping as your number six. So he's probably number eight on the roster right now, as far as wide receivers go. So he has work to do. Now we know the four for sure in, in Watson, Reed, Dobbs, and Samari Toure. Like those four are going to make the team. Now there's two spots left for four wide receivers. Dontavian Wicks, who is a extremely likely candidate to get that number five. And then it's number six, which is Malik Heath, Grant Dubose, and Bo Melton. And, you know, Melton was a seventh round pick a season ago. He went to Seattle. Green Bay picks him up off the practice squad, but he is going to have to battle tooth and nail because we know that Goody loves to keep his draft picks, which Grant Dubose was a seventh round pick. And Malik Heath has been like the story of rookie mini camps and OTA so far. So that is going to be a tough spot for Melton. And like I said, you're feeling like, hey, I might even be in like the conversation for the number four or at least the number five spot. And it's now it's like, man, he's going to have to fight for everything just to try to get the number six spot on the team. So definitely a uh, a bit of a down uh, downer, just like what's happened for, a, for from Bo Melton's side of things. Number four, we're going to stick at the same position. And that's Grant Dubose. Like he goes in the seventh round. I think there were some people that thought maybe he would be more of like a fifth or sixth round guy. He gets taken at the end of round seven, you know, and then I think a lot of people are really excited about him, but then he has the injury and he doesn't get to participate in OTAs or mini camps. And so many times I can just put, you know, young rookie players, regardless of position behind the eight ball. The hope is that when training camp comes along, he'll be ready to go. But if he misses any more time, that's going to be extremely detrimental to his development early in his career. We saw Christian Watson was able to overcome missing a lot of the offseason last year and was able to come in and, and, you know, provide an impact. But a lot of that impact wasn't until the second half of the year. It's a little bit different when you're Christian Watson picked like just outside of the first round and you're Grant Dubose who's trying to fight for a spot as like one of the last seventh round picks. So you hate when injuries derail rookies like early in their career. You would just love to see them get off to that strong start. If he's ready and, and ready to go for day one of training camp, I don't think it's that big of a deal. But anytime you're a rookie, especially a late round rookie, you want to get as many reps to show yourself, improve yourself, and just learn the position as soon as you can. And with Dubose being hurt so far, that certainly hurts, especially as we just talked about. Malik Heath made the most of those reps in Grant Dubose's absence. You still have to go against a Bo Melton and Dontavian Wicks, etc., to try to earn that roster spot. So a tough break so far for Grant Dubose. Number five on my list is Jonathan Garvin. And this is like, you look back a couple seasons when he was a seventh round pick and he's probably thinking, all right, like by this time, 2023, like Preston Smith's probably going to be gone. And like, you know, yes, it's still going to be Rashawn Gary's team, but like, I might be able to even get my name in the conversation for like a starting job or whatever the case may be. But instead, Preston's still here. Rashawn, who knows when he's going to be back, but he's still edge number one on this team. Kingsley and Igbari showed out a season ago as a fifth round pick and has moved himself well ahead of Jonathan Garvin. 
And then they draft Lucas Van Ness in the first round. You have, you know, uh, Brenton Cox, who has already been name dropped by Coach Matt LaFleur as a player who's been impressive going from rookie mini camps to mini camps and OTAs. Like Ladarius Hamilton, certainly in the conversation with Jonathan Garvin at his spot on the team. This is a player that, you know, by this time you were hoping was going to be, you know, competing and like as a real rotational player, at least like a number three edge. He's looking more like number seven, number eight on this roster right now for edge rushers. And if there's not a significant step for Garvin, Green Bay probably fairly easily goes in another direction. So the addition of Lucas Van Ness and Brenton Cox as an undrafted free agent did not spell great things for Jonathan Garvin, and he easily could find himself on the way out as Green Bay makes their final roster cuts. Number six is Patrick Taylor. And this is another one where like Patrick Taylor's probably thinking, all right, by 2023, Aaron Jones is probably gone by that point. And yes, AJ Dillon's still there, but you know, I can certainly be the backup by that point. But instead, Jones is still there. Dillon's still there. They draft Lou Nichols in the seventh round. Tyler Goodson has looked fantastic in rookie or in mini camps and OTA so far. And this is a player who is on the 53-man roster in multiple seasons, who's found his way to that 53. And he's probably running back five at the moment would be my guess. You know, he might be like number three, potentially in theory, as like if you had to play a game today as to like what running back would you want in the game? When they start looking at, you know, upside and contract and age and like all those sort of things, like he's five and it it might not be close at the moment. So this is a player I've always really liked in Patrick Taylor. I think he's good at everything. I don't think he's great at anything. Catches the ball pretty well, runs pretty well, pass protects pretty well, plays special teams pretty well. He's like, he's just okay across the board at kind of everything. Um, I think he needs to figure out something he can do at a little bit of a higher level if he wants to, you know, try to make the 53 this upcoming season. But with the addition of Nichols, with the, you know, Goodson stepping up, Jones still on the roster, things are not looking great for Patrick Taylor so far. Next on my list is Innis Gaines. This is a player who at the end of last year was getting significant snaps with the defense in the final two games of the season. They tried him out in the slot role and it, he played pretty well, all things considered. And I thought maybe that this was going to be a chance of like, all right, they, they legitimately trusted him in huge games to play on defense. Like in their, you know, in the, those key games, like they, he was in there and I thought that would maybe translate to him playing safety in a significant, maybe not significant role, but like have a chance to earn that spot in 2023. But instead you got Savage back. They bring back Rudy Ford. They bring back Dallin Levitt. They bring in Tavarius Moore. They bring in Jonathan Owens. They draft Anthony Johnson Jr. in the seventh round. The good news for Ennis Gaines is that like from a high-end talent standpoint, it's not like any of those guys are beating him by all that much. Like he has every right to earn a roster spot as pretty much any of those other guys, and maybe even a starting spot. Like there's no guarantees for any of the players on this roster, but the level of competition is certainly a lot more intense because Green Bay brought all those guys back and brought a couple new guys in, three new guys in. So it's going to be very competitive at that safety spot, but it is clear that nobody's just going to have their spot handed to them. And clearly Innis Gaines a part of that as well. You're not making any off-season decisions based on just Innis Gaines, but you could have envisioned a scenario where maybe they don't bring back, a, you know, a Dallin Levitt, they don't bring in a Jonathan Owens, and then maybe there's a couple less guys that he has to compete against. Now that level of competition is much steeper in one misstep or one poor play or anything, and you could get your name out of that conversation and end up not making a 53-man roster. So a little bit of a tough break for Innis Gaines there as well. Number eight on my list is Josiah DeGuara. This is a player who I think could have seen a much bigger role, at least projected going into the season, depending on what happened at tight end. Robert Tunyon leaves. You know, you've got Mercedes Lewis, as we just talked about, no longer on the team. And you're probably thinking like, hey, I've got this rapport built in with Jordan Love already. Like I'm, I'm going to get some significant playing time. And it's like, oh, they draft Luke Musgrave in the second round. They draft Tucker Craft in the third round. They st- they bring back Tyler Davis, uh, even Austin Allen, Cameron McDonald. Some of those guys are really intriguing as well. I think Josiah DeGuara has a spot on this roster, but he went from a player that might have seen some pretty significant playing time to now he's going to have to earn every snap again. I think this is going to be quite the rotation at tight end. And there's enough talent on this roster where if things just don't go quite his way, 
No, like I said, it'd be very surprising and shocking, I think, if he wasn't on the team, but maybe not quite impossible anymore. This is a player that was a third round pick, expected to be a major contributor for this team, and we just haven't seen that out of DeGuara so far. So I'm hopeful that this can be the year and he takes a step in the right direction, but this is going to be a very big offseason for DeGuara. And I just think the additions of Luke Musgrave and Tucker Craft are like, hey, loud and clear, the time is now for you to step up. Number nine on my list is AJ Dillon. And this is a little bit of a tougher one. And I don't think that he's had like a bad off season by any means, right? I think if you look at it, he's I, I, he, see, he knows that he needs to be a little bit more explosive, a little bit more dynamic. I've seen some of that as I talked about. I saw him make a jump cut in minicamp that I've never seen him make before in college or in the pros. Like he just looks to be making uh, a little bit um, or at least it looks a little bit more spry and trying to make some of those you know, players miss up front so we can get to the second level and make some of those corners and safeties, make some business decisions. But I think if you look at you know where AJ Dillon was wanting to be, he he this was a clear there was clearly a design and a role for Dillon to be running back number one by this point. And we talk about another Aaron, and we talked about this yesterday, where like Jordan Love and Aaron Rodgers they were tied together. Like where if Rodgers was still here, Jordan Love might not be, but the Packers decide to go and trade away Aaron Rodgers. And that makes Jordan Love quarterback number one. The same thing can be said in a lot of ways for AJ Dillon and Aaron Jones. I think the hope for Green Bay was that Dillon was maybe not quite the next Derrick Henry, but like a, you know, really, really good running back who looked like a legitimate number one. And if that was the case, Maybe they don't need to bring back an Aaron Jones and continue to pay him. So instead, I don't think Dylan has quite showed that. And in fact, they've shown that they can be a pretty good one to you know, combo together. But had Green Bay decided to move on from Aaron Jones, then Dylan takes that number one spot. And then you look at a Tyler Goodson or one of the other running backs as a potential number two. But unlike the quarterback position where they moved on from that Aaron at the running back position, they did not move on from that Aaron. And I think if you're looking at year four for a second round pick at running back, you were hoping that AJ Dillon could have potentially been the guy at this point. It hasn't really come to fruition and a lot of upside still for AJ Dillon. I think this has the potential to be one of the best seasons of his career. It's a contract year, but I think if you were looking from an AJ Dillon point of view as to where he would have liked to have been at this point in 2023, I think it would have been his running back one. That's not the case. Jones is still around. He's running back two. And he's going to have to earn everything and hopefully get that playing time and you know give himself an opportunity to earn that big contract next season. Then last but not least, number 10 on my list is Rashawn Gary. And due to no fault of his own, not because he's lagging behind from an injury standpoint, not because they brought back Preston Smith and drafted Lucas Van Ness and you know found Brenton Cox and undrafted. For, none of that has anything to do with it. As I mentioned through the last few podcasts, I'm going through my rewatch. I'm now through week four. And I think Rashawn Gary has, I think, five sacks through week four. He has just been dominant through those first four games on the rewatch. And this was a player who was setting himself up to be one of the premier edge rushers in the game, who was going to get one of the biggest edge rusher contracts in the game. And had it not been for a torn ACL, I think that deal is already signed, sealed, and delivered. And Rashawn Gary is one of the best paid edge rushers in the NFL right now. I still expect the deal to get done. I expect the extension to happen sooner. Well, I don't know when it's going to happen, but I expect it to get done hopefully this off season. I still expect him to be paid extremely well, but because of an ACL, maybe that contract is slightly lower. Maybe there's a little bit more hesitation and trepidation on the Packers part for how much guaranteed or whatever the case may be. It just changes the calculus enough where, like I said, I think if that doesn't happen, I think Rashawn Gary has a massive, massive season a year ago. And I think he already has one of the richest edge rusher contracts in the NFL. Instead, he's still waiting. And I'm sure he would love to have that contract locked down at this point. It's going to get done at some point. He's going to be a long-term Green Bay Packer. I don't really have any doubt about that whatsoever, but it probably cost him a little bit of money. And I think the deal probably would have been done already had that whole ACL situation not happened. So in some capacity, a bit of a loss there for Rashawn Gary. So my biggest losers of this offseason for the Packers so far, Mercedes Lewis and Mason Crosby as number one, then Sean Ryan at number two, Bo Melton at three, Grant DuBose at four, Jonathan Garvin at five, Patrick Taylor at six, 
Ennis Gaines at seven, Josiah DeGuara at eight, AJ Dillon at nine, and Rashawn Gary at 10. That is going to do it for me today. Thank you so much for joining me. We'll be right back here tomorrow. Hit subscribe, tell a friend, tell everyone about the Pack-A-Day podcast. That'd be amazing. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.